Hello, hello. Hello. Uh, Mary, you're back so soon, and we're so happy to have you back. How are you? Good. It's been a treat last time, and I really wanted to come back to talk about more cost optimization topics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we are going to be talking about savings plans recommendations today and everything around um, how to figure out how much savings plan to buy. Um, you have done so many cool things with this functionality um, in the past like year and a half, and I'm really excited to walk through them. Uh, before we get into that, can you just give the folks like a, a one minute intro of who you are, what your backstory is, and where you of came course, from? Of course. Um, so I've been in cloud optimization for the last I, I stopped counting. I think it's definitely more than five years. Uh, I focused a lot on uh, FinOps functionality um, during that period. And in the last two plus years, I've been the product manager of savings plans recommendations in AWS. And yeah, we launched a lot of cool stuff. I really enjoy doing that. Uh, I think it's a cool challenge and we get to help a lot of people along, along the way. So I love talking to customers and you know, kind of really modifying the features to help them solve the problems. Yeah, absolutely. I mm -hmm. definitely feel you on like not counting anymore. I feel mm -hmm. like at this point I introduce myself on calls or if I'm talking to a new customer that I've never worked with before, they like hear how long I've been at AWS and they're like, wow, you really butt around the block. Like, you <laughs> yeah. don't have to make me feel so old. <laughs> like that was not necessary. <laughs> but yeah, it's an exciting space. Um, and lot going on for sure. Um, before we get into the savings plans, like meat and potatoes of the episode, though, mm -hmm. I did want to take a minute to highlight one of the super exciting launches that your team had yesterday, yesterday. and talk about cost optimization hub for a little bit. Um, every time I feel like every time I ping you, you have like the little rocket ship emoji on your Slack status <laughs> for launch and like you've launched something. <laughs> so I was, I'm always excited yeah. uh, to see, but we can pull it up. Um, I'm happy to kind of take, take us through it. If you mm -hmm. want to talk through. Um, yeah, of course. So last year we launched cost optimization hub we like to call it COH, just kind of to save time. Um, and it basically aggregates all the savings plans. Oh, it's not savings plans. It's all the savings recommendation across AWS and aggregates it into one spot. And if you log in through a payer or management account, it's the same thing, same term for the, for the same thing. Uh, you see the recommendation across all the accounts and all the regions, which is super cool because then you have one view for the whole organization. And what we launched yesterday is a delegated admin where the payer account can give this ability to another user uh, for them to manage that um, savings, just the views, look at all the recommendations uh, for all the accounts in the system. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and I know a lot of folks are definitely moving towards kind of like a decentralized management um, or kind of delegating different folks within the organization to kind of responsibility for different things. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about kind of why this is important and who this would be most interesting to? Yeah, of course. So we speak with a lot of customers where their CTO or their CEO will have access to the payer account and the rest of the team, even the FinOps practitioner on the team would not have access to that. Okay. We also do encourage people to manage anything they can out of the payer account uh, for security purposes. That's the security best practices. Uh, so yeah, so we definitely encourage to do that. Awesome. Okay, so let's... Let's turn it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, let's see. Um, it's pretty easy to get to. Uh, so you just enter into billing and cost management. And again, I'm just in my test account. So not a ton to look at in here, uh, but we can at least kind of have something. Yeah, yeah, I've got, what is that? Like a little bit, I've got a savings plan. That's good. Is it Not covering smart. anything? Unclear. <laughs> <laughs> and billing conductor, because this is my billing conductor demo account. Nice. Um, but what you're going to do is scroll all the way down to the bottom of this left-hand menu here. And then in the, in the preferences and settings section, go to cost management preferences. And then we go to 
cost optimization hub. And now we've got this new checkbox. Nice. And this new drop down. Um, so you can come in here and basically it'll allow you to select any of the accounts that you would like to delegate that admin user to. Mm -hmm. um, not a ton going on in here. Got my three little demo playground accounts in here. Um, but you can take your pick of, of which one you want to make the admin. And then as soon as you click save down there and kind of wait for the system to think and propagate, you'll be good to go. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm actually, it's cool to see this because it's the first time I'm seeing somebody else demoing this <laughs> <laughs> as this was launched yesterday. Um, yeah, so once you save the preference, it will give that account the view of the admin. So this this account, you you logged in through the admin. And another cool thing is that account will know they are a delegated admin. So they Ooh. will have a little message that says you are a delegated admin and you're viewing this with um, admin privileges. So that's cool. That's actually yes. super important. The amount of times that I've had folks like FinOps practitioners specifically log into like Cost Explorer and try to try to look at something through the payer account and net amortized is always what does it if you don't have discount visibility mm -hmm. uh, for RIs and savings plans like propagated to all the linked accounts and you're a FinOps person and you're f filtered down to one single linked account in the payer trying to show <laughs> that owner their stuff and it looks completely different for them in the linked account. So absolutely huge putting a flag up there. That's awesome. Nice. Uh, I'm I'm not going to grace uh, ABC Playground linked account three with admin privileges today. <laughs> so <laughs> we can exit out of here. But I wanted to make sure that we highlighted that, especially because it's like so hot off the press and so mm -hmm. soon. So new. Yeah. Awesome. Perfect. All right. Let me pull that down. Awesome. So. We've got a couple things to show today around savings plan recommendations and kind of savings <laughs> plans in general. Uh, but before we get to kind of the, the show and tell portion of the tooling that we have, um, I did want to kind of give a little refresher on like some of the basic savings plans concepts, um, mm -hmm. some of the common questions that we get. Uh, so folks in the chat, if you have any questions about savings plans or any burning questions about the functionality in general, please drop them in. We can address them. Um, but before we get into that, like, let's refresh the folks on what a savings plan is and kind of why they would want to purchase one. Let's go. All right. Uh, do you want to take the first pass at kind of what the savings plan is or I can take it away too? Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Awesome. So savings plans are a commitment-based savings product uh, that AWS has in order to help folks like you optimize the amount of spend. Um, and kind of the, the concept there is you make a commitment to run a certain either type of resource or a certain dollar amount uh, for either a one or three year term. And because that gives AWS a little bit more information about what your usage is going to look like, um, we can give it to you at a discount. So you can think of it kind of like a coupon. Um, they are a sister product to reserved instances. Um, if you'll remember way back before, I believe it was 2019, uh, we only had reserved instances, which are, again, a very similar concept. You tell us what you're going to be running, um, and we give it to you at a discount. Um, but savings plans are a lot more flexible um, and have kind of a couple different flavors that folks should know about. They're also available for a couple different products um, than reserved instances. So you can get a SageMaker savings plan, for example, but not a SageMaker RI. So in terms of how savings plans apply, um, you can think of them as kind of stacking on top of your EC2 usage in order to bring that total cost margin down. Um, the big difference between savings plans and RIs is how you commit. So with a savings plan, you commit at a dollar amount per hour, whereas with a reservation or an RI, you would essentially commit based on like a an instance type. So you could have a... Uh, an RI of one M5X large in Northern Virginia. Whereas with a savings plan, you'd commit based on kind of dollars per hour, um, how much are you going to be running? And depending on kind of the type of 
commitment that you're trying to make and kind of the, the depth of the savings margin that you're looking for and how sure you are that your workload isn't going to move, you can either select an instant savings plan, um, which is a little bit more specific. You commit to an instance family and a region with an instant mm -hmm. savings plan or a compute savings plan, which is our most flexible offering. Um, it is just kind of a dollar per hour figure within the entire world um, across your entire AWS ecosystem. So anything I missed there? I know that was a lot no, of information. No. <laughs> You've covered it all. I, I would yeah. say that, yes, the compute savings plans is the easiest ones to use. Um, and it's really hard to make a mistake with that one. Uh, so we see that a lot of customers are happy uh, after they purchase a compute savings plan. Yep. Um, and I did want to dig into that a little bit more because I think understanding kind of the nuances of how compute savings plans apply and how they work are mm -hmm. a big piece of understanding how the functionality that you're about to demonstrate works. Yeah. Um, oh, and I've got a good question as well. Oh, we okay. Have questions. Yeah, Exciting. I've got questions in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> So first one of the day is how do savings plans and RIs mix? Um, I'm, I'm happy to say it works exactly how you want it to, which is great. <laughs> I love it when I can say that at AWS. Um, yeah. So we have kind of RIs for a couple of services that we don't have savings plans for, including RDS, Elasticash, Redshift, et cetera. Uh, so those are kind of completely left alone by any savings plan that you do purchase. But within the EC2 space, we have a lot of customers who are running both savings plans and RIs at the same time um, and has have kind of a mix um, because the kind of savings plans launched at a point in time when RIs already existed, uh, obviously for a while, basically everybody had a mix of both. But mm -hmm. essentially the way that our system works is it's going to apply um, your savings products from most specific to most flexible. So if you've got a zonal RI that reserves capacity, that's the most specific thing that you can get. Those are going to apply first because they're the least flexible. We're going to kind of inch on up the stack, shall we say, until at yeah. the end we'll get to compute savings plans, which are the most flexible that you could possibly have. And they'll kind of go wherever they need to go, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll add that what it really does is gives the user the maximum amount of dollar savings amount possible. That's how yeah. it's it's optimized to do that. So no matter what you buy, you get the biggest bang for your buck. That's how it works. Yeah, exactly. And that philosophy, I think, <laughs> is what makes a compute savings plan application order um, one so powerful, but also kind of take a little bit to wrap your head around. So yeah, it's it's can, neat, but it's complex. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's cool, but it definitely makes it hard to kind of understand, okay, what if I had a compute savings plan at this point, which is why you've built so many cool tools to help us yeah. think about that. <laughs> yeah. um, let me pull up the pricing page for a second, because I, I think love that page. Yeah, it's one of my favorite pages. I think I've it's like, I feel like I access it once or twice a day. Um, yeah, I think I but... show it in every customer call we have yeah. to explain how it works. I think that clarifies that. Yes. All right. Especially so... it's event. Do you get any time customer questions that they ask you? Okay, if I buy, let's say $4 of savings plans, how much will I pay at the end? Will I pay less than four dollars because it gives me a discount? Yep, that's a common, <laughs> that's a common one. Uh, good company, Frank L eighty one also loves the pricing okay, page. Nice. We do love the pricing Thank page. You. But yeah, Mary, that's a super common question as well of like, how is this actually going to show up in my bill? Um, mm -hmm. So, I I'm on the compute tab right here. We'll we'll take it to Virginia. Sorry, Ohio. Um, but essentially. In order to kind of understand or scope out some of the pricing here, what you can do is select your term length, payment option, all your specs, and then we can scroll down to kind of this bottom table and let me make this. Oh, that's funky. A little bit bigger. So hopefully mm -hmm. everybody can see that. So can you kind of talk me through what these numbers mean and, and how this translates to like actually purchasing a savings plan? Yeah, of course. So after you selected the configuration, 
each instance type in each region ha might have a different savings plan, uh, savings, plan, savings percentage. Mm -hmm. um, so here in this table, you can see the instance type, then the savings plan rate. This is what you pay if it's covered under a savings plan, the percentage of savings over on demand. And you can see that it varies between instance types. Um, and then the on-demand rate, this is what you pay if it's not covered. So if you buy, let's say, just $5 of savings plan, it will go to the ones that are discounted the most first, uh, and then it will trickle to the ones that are discounted the least until it finishes the coverage, and then you get your on-demand rate for the rest of your uh, instance types. Because uh, usually we see some, you know, some, there is some level of uh, on-demand rate that customers still like to keep it flexible or if they have some, you know, event that happened once a month. Um, so, yeah. And the way, like, the, to answer the question uh, we, we posed earlier, so if you buy $5, it will apply the $5 on the savings plan rate until it reaches $5. That, and that's how you can kind of think about it. So you get the savings plan rate for the amount of savings, the dollar per hour you committed, and then you continue to pay the on-demand rate. And the way that savings plan is applied is for your benefit to maximize your dollar amount. Yeah. Yep. So is that kind of like... Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. No, I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's kind of a difficult concept to like wrap your brain around the first time you look at it. But I think like looking at the numbers helps a lot. So yeah. you commit at the discounted rate and that is the amount that you will pay. The mm -hmm. way that that kind of shows up in your billing artifacts too, is you'll see savings plan covered usage in Cost Explorer the Curve. You'll also see savings plan negation. So it's really easy for you to essentially see like, how much has actually been covered by a savings plan. Um, but if we're just kind of taking a look at this example table that we have here. So if I'm a savings plan and I'm looking for what to apply to, the first thing I'm going to apply to in this scenario is this 29% T4G nano, because that's the highest mm -hmm. discount rate. After I've exhausted all of my 29%, we'll go to 28%. And then after I've exhausted all my 28%, I'll go to 27%. And I kind of keep making the way down the line until I'm either out of savings plan or I'm out of usage. Mm -hmm. um, and I've got another question. Are there different rates of discounts depending on purchase options? One year, three year, no upfront partial. Great question. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> you can go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you can actually f see the difference in the discount rates if you play around in this page and select one year versus three year. Three year will always give you a higher discount because it's a longer commitment. One year will give you a little less and you can always experiment uh, in this table. Same for all upfront, no upfront. It always has some little difference of discount. Um, all upfront gives you the max uh, savings. Um, and, um, yeah, no upfront will give you less, but, uh, yeah, you can just try it uh, in this drop down, and you will see exactly how much savings you get for each instance type. Yep. So I can play around with it a little bit. I hope this is big enough for everybody to see. It's a little bit hard to get it all in, um, one screen, but I'm just looking at the C5 family, super common one. Um, and as I toggle through these guys, you'll see it reload and you'll see the mm -hmm. on-demand savings percentage change as well as the savings plan rate. So big thing to note here is that the term length is one of the bigger factors um, and one of the bigger levers in order to like get that rate up as high as it possibly can be. Um, and I think this is a really powerful um, way of speaking to how compute savings plans can be a really big benefit because they are so flexible. You don't need to know exactly where, what you're going to be running three years from now. You just need to know that you will be running something from three or three years from now. Um, and with kind of that knowledge in your back pocket, you can get or kind of actualize that 52% rather than what is the one year 27%. Like that's yep. a pretty significant jump. Mm -hmm. um, another cool thing is that sometimes 
customers will ask, hey, what if I have two savings plans with different configurations? You know, how does that work? And as you said earlier, just how you want it to work. It will give you the the most of the benefit first, and then it will trickle down trickle down to the to the least uh, um, savings percentage. Yeah. Um, so yeah. The way that I usually like to think about it is if you look at your entire savings plan fleet, um, even if you have like one of everything, basically in every single configuration, um, take a snapshot of what that looks like in the moment. And then think about the usage that you have and then what this discount rate stack is going to look like based mm -hmm. on each savings plan. It'll order from kind of greatest to least. And then that's the order it'll apply within your billing family. Kind of hard to conceptualize <laughs> at scale, but that's like the simplest that's way why, yeah, yeah. to explain it. <laughs> That's why we build the recommendations so exactly. you can easily purchase this and you don't even have to understand all of this. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and okay, we've got another question. What's a good cadence to purchase savings plans, monthly or quarterly? And what's a good coverage percent that we should aim for? So in terms of cadence, I think it really depends a little bit on um, kind of what business you have, what your usage looks like, and um, how closely you can kind of monitor it. I've seen folks have a very good success with either, I think we call it like staircasing or laddering. I've heard a lot of different ways to mm -hmm. describe it, but essentially a mix of different savings plans so that you have a savings plan kind of coming off the books. Uh, at a little bit more of a, a higher frequency so that you can renew and be a little bit more agile there. At the end of the day, though, a lot of it really depends on your business. If you are a completely steady state shop, or yeah. for example, if you're like, if you have one single business unit that's completely steady state on AWS, like there's not going to be any fluctuation. They know exactly what they're going to be doing. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with doing just an annual purchase or once every three year purchase for them. But what we generally see folks do is something a little bit more staggered, um, quarterly, monthly, whichever is sustainable to you is going to be the best answer there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We see different business, different purchasing strategies from different companies. Um, and yeah, it, it really depends on the business. So, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And then what is a good coverage percent that we should oh, aim for? That's such a loaded question. Um, no. I would say that the one that gives you the maximum amount of savings, uh, that's the best coverage. So there is no one number of coverage that yeah. is ideal. Uh, it depends on what how your usage looks like, right? Because yeah. some companies, they do have a drops in the weekend. Some are um, internationals or other, it depends on the type of business. They might not have a drop in the weekend. They might have a spike in the weekend. Um, some users turn off their uh, fleets during the off hours, some not, because maybe they have a business that runs 24 uh, seven. So it really depends uh, on the type of usage you have. And again, that's why we build the recommendation tool to show you what we recommend for you to buy based on your usage. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And again, like, I think all of us on the optics team and everybody on kind of the support side of AWS hesitates before prescribing anything, especially to a customer that you don't know. Once mm -hmm. you get a better sense of kind of what's going on um, in their business or kind of with their AWS journey, it's a little bit easier to, to target something. So if you are uh, migrating onto AWS and you know you're going to double your footprint in the next six months, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with targeting like a very high coverage percentage, especially with a compute savings plan or something so flexible, like you know, you're going to continue growing. But maybe if you're kind of at the end of that journey, or you're about to start right sizing a lot, maybe that's when we would look to kind of pull it down until we know what that steady state's going to look like. Mm -hmm. So it can depend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I've heard layer cake also for the battering and stacking. <laughs> That's a new one that for one me. Yeah, yeah. I, like that. <laughs> I think I'm going to use this one next Yeah, time. it is like a layer cake. Yeah. I, I appreciate that. Okay. All right. So I feel like we've, we've hyped it up enough. Mm -hmm. We've talked around it a lot. <laughs> is it time to yeah. show the recommendations page? <laughs> I think All so. Right. I think yeah. it is. 
Cool. I will pull up kind of the base of what it looks like in the account that we're going to be taking a look at today. And I think a lot of folks oof, have seen it before. Uh, it's an eye test right now. So give me a second to zoom in and you'll be seeing it again. All right. Nice. Here we go. Um, so Mary, do you want to take us through like what all the knobs and dials are yeah, here? Of course. Awesome. Um, I would start with a refresh button that we uh, launched a few years ago. Um, so we're automatically refreshing the recommendation every couple of days uh, just to keep it fresh. Uh, but you, as the user, can refresh it any time. Uh, and it's actually really beneficial for a few scenarios. OK, one, okay. you just purchased a savings plan and you want it to be included in the recommendation. So maybe today you purchased a savings plan, but this was generated two days ago. So it doesn't know about your recent purchase. Uh, so that's one reason why you should definitely refresh your recommendations between uh, before you start looking into the numbers we show here. Uh, another reason is if you have an expiration that happened today, mm -hmm. but the savings plans still don't, the recommendations didn't know about that because it, it, they are based on the past um, historical data. So that's another reason. So if you have any change in your savings plans inventory, you should click on the refresh, let the recommendation run through your usage, your active savings plan inventory, so you will get the best, you know, most accurate, up-to-date recommendations. Another case, which is really interesting, is if you change your sharing configuration. So oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah, didn't yeah. Know that. That's cool. <laughs> uh, that's I saved it for the last one. That's kind of a neat one that not a lot of wow. people know about. Um, yeah. So if you change your sharing configuration and decided to uh, limit, like take a linked account and let them just use by themselves the savings plan and not share with uh, the rest of the accounts, or actually if you moved away from that model and allow sharing for all. After you change that configuration, um, you can go ahead and after a minute or two, just refresh the recommendation and that will take the, all the configurations that you have right now into account. And it will definitely impact the recommendations because um, then now this account is sharing uh, and will take that usage into account as well as their its savings plan inventory into account. Got it. That's yeah. actually really interesting um, and could be super powerful for folks who are like if you're working on any sort of acquisition or merge of AWS organizations, because mm -hmm. I've seen folks when they kind of bring new accounts in, sometimes they'll kind of keep them sequestered in that no sharing environment to see how it's going to go and make sure that everything's in before they generate a recommendation. So it's super cool that it will kind of take into account any of those configurations. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. I'm glad I have, you know, that's why we're yeah. doing this switch. <laughs> Learn something new every day. That's awesome. Okay. okay. Uh, cool. Awesome. Yeah. So then we have the all the configurations the user can do. Um, so first, yeah, you can select between Compute Savings Plan, EC2 Savings Plan, and SageMaker. And there is also a little explanation because there's so, many, so much detail to take into account. Uh, so you can see that the compute savings plan underneath that, you can see that it also covers Fargate and Lambda. So if you kind of forget about it, you can always take a look like, oh, right, it's covering more than that. Because sometimes we see, um, you know, that it, it gets lost, right? They will yeah. look at Cost Explorer only at AC2 and try to buy a savings plan only for AC2 and kind of like look at all these charts. And then we say, hey, by the way, the you also it also covers Fargate and Lambda, so you should take that into account. Uh, that is <laughs> one of the most common questions I've gotten when people switch to savings plans is like, I've got a bunch of stuff that's covered that's never been covered before. What's what is going on? Or if they're looking at totals, um, mm -hmm. like some of the the stats and like the utilization report, and they're trying to tie that out somewhere else. Uh, and only filtering to EC2, they're like, where is the savings plan going? Like, none of my numbers are matching. And it's right. like, it's the Fargate. <laughs> it's a bunch of Lambda that you've got that's getting covered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely. Um, yeah. So so that's why we, like, have this little note. Please, you know, mm -hmm. take a look again. Yeah. Um, after you select like, the savings plan type, uh, then we have uh, kind of the recommendation configuration. So payer versus linked account. So you logged in through a payer. If you were mm -hmm. a linked account, you would not see that configuration. 
because uh, then you just get recommendations for your account. Got it. Yeah. Um, if you click on linked account, then everything will be per linked account at the bottom. But I think we it's we we can uh, you know just experiment with payer today. Yeah. Um, My for... internal account sometimes a little. <laughs> yeah. It's it's good. Internal it, accounts it, are already always. Creepy. I know. Yeah, it's I not always... wired up the, the same as the real accounts. Yeah. Um, yeah. The savings plan term, as you demoed previously yep. on the other screen, is just like, do you want to commit to one year or three year? And it's definitely going to impact the con uh, recommendation because the three year will give you more discount, and then the recommendation uh, will be able to increase actually your coverage with a higher discount. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, one thing that I really love about this page is, again, like it's kind of similar to the toggle that we were doing in the, the pricing page, but it's really easy to just kind of swap between these radio buttons when you're first exploring or first trying to make one of these decisions um, and really look at what's going on. And then I want to talk a little bit about this based on the past mm -hmm. piece here. Um, what are the use cases there for like seven days versus 30 versus 60? When do folks want to yeah. use which one? Uh, that's, that's a great question. So they should use whatever they think will reflect the future. So they might, you know, in the last seven days, right-sized all their EC2 fleet. And now they're saying, okay, this is what I want to cover. And the last 30 days, has more information that they don't want to include, right? Like it was, there was some app sizes that they want to ignore. So we do recommend like thinking, you can also, we will show in a second the charts behind uh, each recommendation. Um, so you can also see it visually after you open each recommendation, but definitely try to think, hey, you know, I think this is how my future is going to look like and, and select that time period. Uh, some customers are more conservative. They just like, hey, I just want the, more information, right? More historical yeah. data. Uh, so they go for the 60 days. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. All right. Question from the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, not that one. But this one. How do I see coverage and utilization predictions with these? Oh, that's a great question. Ooh, we're coming <laughs> up. <laughs> awesome. So let me <laughs> scroll down a little bit. And we can look at, uh, can you be, um, okay, there we go. A little bit of like what this tool actually spits out. And then I want to talk through what these numbers mean. And then I can pass to you and we can look at all the pretty charts. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Um, so in terms of what this is recommending, I think mm -hmm. the, the question that we get is, what are we targeting here? Are we targeting 100% coverage? Where is this number coming from? Like, how are we getting here? So I know you know all the nuts and bolts of what goes on behind the scenes. So yeah, <laughs> demystify it for me, Mary. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's demystify how the recommendation works. Um, we are targeting. So what happens is the user selects all these. Uh, first, you select all the configurations. And then we look at the historical, the lookback period you selected. And for the usage you had in the lookback period, we look for the point that will produce the maximum amount of savings. That's what it's targeting. If you buy more than maximum amount of savings, then you're going to do, start diminishing your savings. If you buy below this point, you're gonna start missing on some savings that are possible for you to get. So that's the that that's the sweet spot of purchasing the savings plan. That's the that's the number based on the historical data that you selected. Now, if you select different, you can explore and see seven days how much you the recommendation is telling you versus thirty days, and if you have variations in the usage, that number will change. Um, and that's why I'm saying like you should really look at the historical data and and guesstimate how your future is going to look like when you select uh, the final commitment you're going to make. Got it. Yeah. So it's not, it's not a hundred percent coverage. Nope. It's not a certain mystery <laughs> number. It's how much money There's you're going to no, save. Exactly. There's no hundred percent utilization. It's not hundred yeah. percent coverage. It's smarter than that. And um, moreover, it takes the, the nice explanation we, and but complex explanation we had for the allocation of how, what it's going to, 
apply to first, the mm -hmm. algorithm also does that uh, for every hour in the lookback period to find that number that will maximize your savings. Yes, it's wow. that. It's actually uh, very smart. Yeah. Awesome. Well, one quick question before we mm -hmm. jump into graphs. <laughs> Can I return a savings plan if I make a mistake? So <laughs> I want to first say that these tools make it very difficult to make a mistake as long as you're kind of targeting your purchases off of what's been recommended here. Um, with that said, uh, I believe this launched like, was it six months ago? Yeah, it was uh, it's somewhere in it the beginning of this year. Yes. <laughs> it was a big day for us. I'll <laughs> say that. Uh, but the answer is yes. Uh, we do have a seven day return period. Um, so you can purchase, take a look at how it's acting in your billing. Um, generally, I see customers that are kind of not necessarily using the savings plan tooling that we have, um, but are like keying in things through the purchase activity, uh, leverage this a little bit more. But yeah, we do have a seven day return period, um, which to be honest, I think is for peace of mind more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of takes the stress out of some of these larger purchases for sure. Yeah. And we also put guardrails um, after like closer to that release. So if you're trying to purchase something over the recommended amount, we will let you know, hey, you know, are you sure you want to make this purchase because it's over the recommended amount? Uh, and some customers still proceed because they are buying for for increase in the future. So yeah, you can you can still do that. That's okay as long as you know you know you know your usage the best at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. All right. So we can pretend that I've clicked on this view details button. <laughs> I'm gonna pull up your screen that has the view details button okay. and let you drive. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, here we go. So okay. utilization, coverage, we see them right in that little bar, but let's talk about cost first. Okay, actually, I, I will even start at the bottom. Okay. Um, here you can see exactly what you selected in the previous page, right? So you don't need to like toggle back and forth like, oh, did I select 60 days or 30 days? Was it the compute one? So everything you select in the previous page is here. Um, so this is the recommendation that is based on the last 60 days. You will see here, um, okay, let me introduce the charts. <laughs> so we have three charts, cost, coverage, and utilization. And it will take the look back period. Now we see here uh, data amount for the last 60 days. And it's actually uh, with hourly granularity. So just like the algorithm works on an hourly basis to maximize the savings and find that uh, sweet spot, um, that's also what we present here. So if you hover over the chart, you will see it's our hour by hour, literally 1 p.m., 2 p.m., 3 p.m. Um, so here we see it's actually, we can call this a layered cake now that I'm thinking about this. So we sure can. It's a different, it's a different You can cake. see the layers on the cake so clearly. Right. I love it. Um, so at the bottom, the first portion, the green part, is the current commitment you have. Um, and as I explained earlier, when you refresh, um, we kind of like, we know exactly what you're committed to right now, right? If something expired or something, uh, is, you purchased something, what we do, even if it happened in the last day, right? Right mm -hmm. over here, something expired and you purchased something, we take the active savings plans you have right now and we extrapolate it to the historical data, right? So we will have the most up-to-date recommendation. Um, that's kind of neat because that's how you don't need to wait for another 60 days to get an accurate recommendation after your inventory changed. Got it. So yeah. if I'm working on building that layer cake in my fleet and I make a purchase and then look at this graph before I do that, and then come back two days later and refresh my recommendations, it'll look different and it'll take into account that savings plan of purchase, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. yeah. So right now, if I look at this, we have current compute savings plan commitment. You have $1. Great, Savannah, you're doing a great job. <laughs> um, if you go. buy, <laughs> let's say, two, another dollar, it mm -hmm. will grow to two. That green area will just reflect two because that's your current coverage. Um, the blue area is the recommendation. So you, 
there is a huge recommendation here because, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of things are uncovered and we'll look at the coverage in a second. Uh, so the recommendation here is big, but it doesn't, you can see that it's not really covering the full on demand because we have the red area. It's very small here uh, in the customer environment. We usually see like a lot of cool patterns. Um, but in this case, we still, we're not even in this case, we're recommending fully to cover the on-demand. Uh, why? Because at some point you get to diminishing returns, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the savings plan starts to cost more than the, the savings you get. And that's why we optimize for max savings. Um, so here you can just scroll view hour by hour, how your environment will look like after you purchase it, right? Because that's the leftover of on-demand uh, that's not going to be covered. Uh, the rest will be covered by this recommendation. Awesome. So yeah. key thing to think about is hourly data. Um, from a customer perspective, if you have a more exciting AWS <laughs> account to look at, shall I say, if you come in here, we'll usually see some additional spikes that tie out to your usage patterns. Um, do people have questions about like how to identify that in other tooling or how can they conceptualize what that looks like in kind of like base cost explorer versus like the hourly view of base cost mm -hmm. explorer versus this one? Yeah, you, you can. So we wanted to shortcut the process for the customers. So it's over here. You can see it here. It's a little different because of the manipulation we do for the savings plan inventory to make this more accurate. Uh, in terms of the recommendation, if you want to purely see your historical data, um, you can take a look at Cost Explorer. You can find the same spikes you will see here in Cost Explorer. But the point is, like, you don't need to go there anymore, right? For when you purchase the recommendation, because you you will see it right here. Got it. Awesome. So yeah. if folks see differences and are wondering why, it's very likely that it's one of the um, some of the like simulation that you guys right. bake yeah, yeah. into it to make it a little bit more reflective of like the real footprint of their fleet at that moment, essentially. Exactly. Because our goal is to make the recommendation the most accurate. It's not really to represent historical data. And actually we did uh, add an explanation at the bottom. Can you see mm -hmm. that text over here? Got it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little and small, if, but... yeah, if you click on learn more, uh, then you can uh, fully read this. Oh, um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there's a little explanation here. Sweet. Should we dive into the other charts? Yeah, let's take a peek <laughs> at the other ones. Okay. Um, so for coverage, here we see what is the coverage. Okay, let's start from the beginning. We see the blue air, the blue line. The blue line nice. is your current coverage. So my one dollar doing work. <laughs> hey, twenty percent for one dollar. I I would say it's pretty good. <laughs> Um, so you the current coverage um, is over here, and the red line is the estimated coverage after you purchase that savings plan. Uh, so we can see that we're really uh, getting very close to 100% coverage. Uh, the usage is pretty flat, so we usually this is again kind of more wavy. Yeah, we see peaks during the weekdays, and then like a little uh, downwards trend during the weekend. Uh, and again, it's hourly based, so you can just scroll through this. We see tiny peaks here, um, and it's re really using it's using the same data in the back end for what we show for cost, but we just show a different metric, which is coverage. So all these three charts are based on the same data. Yeah, um, at the bottom <laughs> over here, you can see your new average coverage. So we just average all, all the hours. It's going to be 98% and the difference between your current coverage and your new coverage. So many times users like this, because they want to increase their coverage by a certain amount of percentage, or they trying to hit a goal. Uh, but here, back to the question earlier, the optimal coverage for this environment is 98%. Got yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And before we dive into utilization, yeah. what's the difference between coverage and utilization? Oh, that's we a get this question, question a lot. <laughs> So then I'll let you take this one. Yeah. Okay. So coverage, you can think about how many hours of EC2 that you're running and what percentage of them are covered by the savings project product that you've purchased um, to calculate your coverage. So if you've got a hundred hours running and 10 of them are on demand 
and everything else is covered by a savings plan, your coverage is 90%. Utilization measures how much of your savings plan is being used. So if you have one of those spiky workloads that we talked about, and let's say you spin everything down for an hour on Friday night, um, just for fun, or to do a reboot or something, you could essentially purchase a savings plan that covers everything except for that little down spike, and you'll yep. see a utilization drop during that moment when things are spun down. Um, and the utilization metric is measuring how consumed your savings plan is during the time that it exists. Yeah. Does that make sense? That's, that's a great explanation. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So so basically, like, like just like you said, in this case, your environment, and actually it's not, it's not like you can even be more specific because in this recommendation, we're looking at the payer level. It means that we're looking at the on-demand from all the accounts, right? So from, let's say in your case, I think we saw you that you have three linked accounts, I think yeah. from the previous uh, section. Um, so we take the, all the usage from the three accounts and right now we know it's covered by 20%, the savings plan is covering 20% of that usage. Um, and we're, we're recommending to increase that. Um, so for the utilization part, right? If you purchase the savings plan, you will get 100% uh, utilization uh, because we see that if you go back to the cost, that it will be utilized 100%. means like under this blue, there is always a red section. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point, you know, you have more red, but it doesn't mean the utilization goes uh, down. It actually means only the coverage goes down. In this case, the utilization is 100% because there's always some on demand behind that blue area. Uh, yeah. 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 The other kind of big question that we have or that we get a lot is, oh, got it in the chat right now. <laughs> is it bad if my utilization drops when I scale down on the weekends? Not necessarily. 100% oh. utilization is not necessarily like the end all be all to aim for at all. And that's a super common misconception, especially with savings plans. I would say I'm personally not troubled when I go in there and look at a customer's account and they've got a compute savings plan that isn't 100% utilized 100% of the time. Because you have to kind of think back to the pricing that we looked at and that pricing page. When you're re reserving a savings plan and, and kind of making that commitment, the price margin is a lot lower um, compared to the on demand. So even if you have kind of those blips where you're essentially like, you can think about it as over provisioned, um, the break-even point is still likely favorable for you in terms of kind of end state dollar amount that you're paying AWS uh, because you're getting those instances that you are running at such a deep discount. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And actually, when you look at these charts, you will see your weekend drops and utilization for that in the weekend. Uh, so you can you can take a look and actually see all the data here. Uh, with your real environment. Uh, and then the recommendation still, the recommendation will take into account that utilization drop in the weekend and will recommend, again, I'm repeating myself, <laughs> but I think it's a good point. It will recommend maximum amount of savings based on your, your historical data. If you had a drop in your utilization, this is looks for 60 days. So all the weekends in the last 60 days, they will have a drop and we'll take them into account. Um, to recommend for you know the, to recommend the purchase so you can always rely on this to guide you right maybe you can want to buy a little less because you're conservative or you you think you you know you're going to have a growth you can buy a little more but you can always know what's the sweet spot of max savings yeah 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 exactly um i always <laughs> I think you probably get this too. It's always hard to explain these things without using the words that are in the name. So like <laughs> utilization report is how much you're utilizing. Cost categories is categorizing your costs. And the recommendation report recommends. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. So we've got about five minutes left before mm -hmm. we wrap up. Um, what else? What else do we need to tell the people? Oh, let's think. Um, we covered um, the charts, covered the yeah. charts, talked through recommendations. 
honestly, the big thing, I know your team is incredibly receptive to feedback. And as I mentioned yeah. at the beginning of the hour, y'all are launching stuff all the time. Um, if we think back to what this page looked like in, in 2019 when, it, when savings plans first launched, like we've come a really, really long way. Uh, and I will say one of the first things that we got a lot of rec like requests for was, can we see recommendations at a linked account level? Because initially it was just payer. That was a super like impactful feature. Um, and all of this is just to say, if you're out there and you have feedback about what this should look like or what would be helpful for your business, please reach out, email questions, feedback, anything to cost optimization at amazon.com. If you have an account team, if you have like an existing relationship with your AWS representatives, please reach out. Like we'll make sure that that feedback gets to the right place. Um, but we design these features and based on what's going to be helpful. And Mary, I know your team does a lot to make sure that it is going to actually mm -hmm. do what you want it to do and solve customer needs. So. Yeah. We love chatting with customers, so please reach out and do one. I want to give a big shout out to my team because they're working so hard. Every number you see, every, oh, it's hourly. It's because they worked really hard to make this happen. So like shout out to the savings plans, this, the cost optimization hub, all these teams are doing amazing jobs and I'm, I'm glad to present their work, you know, with you on the call. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. All right. Um, I don't think I have anything super pressing um, to, to wrap with, but I know we've got Secret Richard in the background <laughs> with the Richard summary. So I'm going to hide my screen and, oh, maybe, maybe I'm going to hide my screen. There we go. Mm -hmm. The suspense. Nice. All the best tools can delegate admin. That's right. <laughs> and now Cost Optimization Hub can. Uh, coverage present is not one size fits all. Absolutely. Use the view details button to visualize your savings plan impact. Um, and don't be afraid of a little underutilization. I oh, love it. Nice. Nice. I love it. All right. Um, we've got one last question in the chat to close this out. And Mary, I think it might be close to your heart. I know it's close to my heart. Um, for enterprises, this is great. But what about a one to two person startup, respectfully? I worked at a startup for a while before I worked at AWS. And I know things are a little bit different, especially in like a scrappy environment. Um, so what are your thoughts on this one? I've got some stuff that I can say too. Yeah. Um, so I would say Actually, sometimes, you know, when you are one to two person startup, this is way easier for you because you, you don't need to reallocate like enterprise customers. They, they have even more processes than we spoke about today. Uh, and for one to person startup, you can look at cost. There is a lot of great tools and cost management. Uh, you can look at Cost Explorer. You can see the recommendations you have. There's visuals. Uh, we always cater uh, to all the types of users when we build these features. And that's why we add all the explanations. So just if you explore that, you will find all the answers you need. Um, yeah, I think yeah. that's. Absolutely, plus one to all of that. I would say the two like really big benefits that you have as an early stage startup are one, you don't have to coordinate amongst thousands of people. Um, that's the hardest part <laughs> that I see customers deal with is trying to like wrangle all their different business units and get everybody a, an understanding of what their strategy looks like. Uh, if you're a one to two person startup, you just have to talk to one person and that simplifies the whole process. Um, the other thing is you get the opportunity to start off on the right foot and establish what these processes are going to look like and make kind of those that like infrastructure and set up that scaffolding in terms of like savings processes great point. right away you get mm -hmm. to do it properly for the first time you will not be in a situation where you're like 10 years down the pipe and you suddenly have to clean up and pivot a bunch of stuff so absolutely pay attention to these things all these tools are still going to work for you um and congrats on your journey that's exciting yeah Awesome. All right. And with that, I think uh, I think we're done for the day. We will be back next Thursday with another episode. Mary, thank you so much for joining us again. I loved walking through this with you. And I think uh, yeah. it's really useful to have met the whole 
the whole spiel out there in the world. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It was a treat. Yeah. All right. Take care, folks. Bye.